130 Israeli host 34 Israeli hostages who have been now held in captivity for 150 days. That is a very long time, five months not knowing whether you're going to survive the day or not, five months not knowing what's happened to the women, the children there. We can only just imagine in our nightmares what has probably happened to some of them. The understanding is that considering the sexual violence that was used during the massacre, that it, there is not a small possibility that some of those women who have remained behind and possibly even some of the men have experienced terrible, terrible things. The fighting in Gaza is continuing on. The IDF forces are continuing to operate in Khan Yunus and around Khan Yunus, moving around towards the western side of the city already, taking control more and more of the eastern side, and now even cutting off an, a small township just outside the area, um, being surrounded by IDF forces. The understanding obviously being that there are substantial Hamas forces there, possibly one might even guess that there possibly are even some hostages being held there. We don't know the IDF today releasing a map of the massive tunnel network that was under, underneath Khan Yunus, where the terrorists have been A, hiding, and B, hiding the hostages. This is a continuing war of vicious terrorism against civilians. And the reason is very, very simple. When you can't beat Israel militarily, what you do is you kill civilians. You kill Israeli civilians and you kill Palestinian civilians. Because by killing Palestinian civilians or causing Israel to kill Palestinian civilians, you are going to hopefully get, as, as Hamas hopes, the sympathy of the world and the support of the international community. That is what this asymmetrical war is talking about. Hamas using Israel's soft underbelly attacking our civilians and causing us to kill their civilians as a ways to a garner international support and b to garner the support of the arab world against israel this is what the 7th of october was about this is the heinous acts that were carried out 150 days ago today these are the hostages that continue to be held by hamas as they play with our sympathies every single day we have given an offer. We haven't given an offer. Today, they said, we've set the terms for what we expect to see from the Israeli government. And the Israeli government said, well, we've heard nothing of it. The interlockers also saying, we've heard no final suggestion or offer from Hamas. But that's part of this psychological warfare that they've been implementing. On the northern front, Hezbollah, another Iranian proxy, continues to attack Israel. We've now seen some 3,000 rockets, anti-tank missiles being fired directly into Israel's north. Um, some 60,000 plus people displaced. Israelis wandering around the country just from the north of the country. There's another 75,000 from the south, but 60,000 plus just from the north of the country who can no longer live in their homes, who have been sent to ho hotels and all types of hostels around the country looking for anywhere to lay their head because they can't stay at home. Hezbollah is attacking their homes with rockets and anti-tank missiles. And there's always the constant threat that the Radwan forces, the Nukba forces, the special forces of Hamas is Nukba, Radwan forces for Hezbollah will storm across the border and carry out another massacre. We know that one of the things that annoyed Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, was that Hamas beat him to that feat of storming the border and murdering as many Israelis as possible. In the south, the Houthis continue on with their aggression and their uh, interference with the freedom of navigation. Another Iranian proxy acting with one sole goal to cause as much damage, as much terror, and as much interruption as possible. The latest UK ship sinking there with 40,000 tons of chemicals, a tremendous ecological disaster. But we're not hearing any of the Green Party standing up and saying, well, why are the Houthis attacking ships in the, the Gulf of Aden? 
Why are they interfering with the freedom of navigation? As they say, no Jews, no news. If it isn't Israel that can be blamed for the crisis, then it doesn't seem to be making the news. In Judea and Samaria, the terrorists are carrying on. We had a, a terrorist attack just two days ago, a, a rabbi and a 16-year-old murdered. Did anyone talk about that? Did anyone mention that? Was UNICEF, the World Children's Organization, shouting from rooftops saying, well, how can it be the children are being murdered? If it's not Israel to blame, they just don't care. And unfortunately, that's what brings us to our discussion today and our expert for today. Our expert for today is, is, is Tom Gross, a former Jerusalem uh, correspondent for the London uh, Sunday, Sunday Telegraph and the, Daily, uh, uh, and the New York Daily News, um, an expert on Middle Eastern affairs, a researcher. <clears throat> and what we're going to try and unwrap a little bit with Tom today is the role of Western media help or hindrance bringing peace to the Middle East. And really, th so firstly, thank you, Tom, for joining us. Hello, good to what be I'd with you. Like, what I'd like to, to, to ask you, Tom, just to, to, to get things going, is that how would you explain the approach of the international media to this whole conflict that's going on? I'll give you, give you just one uh, uh, quick example. I'm sure we can expand that over and over again. On the one hand, the international media totally adopts the number of casualties as set by the Hamas Ministry of Health in Gaza. Now, these are the terrorists telling the world how many people have been killed. In those numbers, there are no te dead terrorists. There are only women and children. The international media laps up that information and says, Israel has killed over 30,000 people. But when Israel says that something has happened by the terrorists, Israel alleges that the terrorists raped women on a wide scale basis. Israel alleges that the Hamas terrorists beheaded babies and beheaded soldiers during the 7th of October massacre. How do you explain that really warped view of reality where the words of terrorists are almost holy and yet the reports of Israel are alleges Oh, well, there's something that we still have to check and we're not really sure because we don't trust the Israelis. Is that what's going on, Tom? Well, yes, it's, it's, it is going on. It's very complicated, though. Um, first of all, the Western media, uh, Western news journalists tend to be, uh, let's say, left wing. They tend to want to change the world. They tend to want to side with the people that they think are the underdog or anti-Western. And we see that in other conflicts too. But undoubtedly, because Israel is a Jewish state, they have a particular um, almost venom for Israel. That's not all journalists, but many, many of the mainstream media. So as you pointed out with some of the statistics by Hamas, in fact, some Western media even give higher statistics than Hamas give. And often the um, Hamas Ministry of Health, which we shouldn't believe a word of, uh, don't actually say that they're all civilians, they're figures, and yet the Western media do say they're all civilians. And of course, this has large consequences because even though the um, traditional Western media is less important than it used to be because today a lot of people rely upon social media and you know Instagram, TikTok, uh, or they don't follow news at all. Even though that's the case, politicians and policymakers um, still want um, to react to mainstream Western media coverage. So in the United States, that would be, of course, you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, ABC, uh, CBS, CNN, and so on. In Britain, where I'm from, that would be the traditional newspapers, more, more over the BBC. So I was just looking actually this morning at two examples from, it's actually yesterday's International New York Times. And the headline there, says starvation is stalking Gaza's civilians. And also a headline this morning from the Washington Post, the other big uh, New York uh, American daily newspaper, that says, I have it on my iPad, that says how Israel's restrictions on aid put Gaza on the brink of famine. Now, 
I've done independent research and Gaza is not starving and not on the brink of famine. There is, of course, hardship there. There's a war on, but there's a big gap between hardship and starvation. Just like there's a big gap between civilians dying inadvertently, as they do in every war, um, when uh, Israel or whoever is targeting terrorists or fighters, and genocide, as various um, pundits have accused Israel of. And of course, this has consequences because there is internal pressure on politicians. For example, the British Foreign Secretary, Foreign Minister David Cameron, who has adopted a more hostile position to Israel than was the case of the British government a couple of months ago. Or indeed comments we see by Vice President Kamala Harris yesterday, in which, which were quite harsh on Israel. And I would say they are reacting as much to media coverage as to any actual um, occurrence of what's happening on the ground, because it is not a British or American or anybody's interest to have the war finish uh, prematurely and allow Hamas, an Iranian-backed terror group, to, to, to in fact declare a victory, which is what would happen if there's a premature ceasefire. So, Tom, just one of those things that you mentioned there that, that I'd just like to pick up and, and, and develop for a second. You talked about the word terrorist. Now, terrorists, it's, it's very clear in our context who we're talking about terrorists. We're talking about people who stormed Israel's border, massacred babies, men, women, children, raped, tortured, beheaded. I think the common uh, uh, terminology, I think that everyone would accept for that, for those people is terrorists. Now, in, in the UK, for example, there, there, there's been an extensive debate as to how to refer to the Hamas members, particularly in, in the BBC. Can you call them terrorists or should you call them militants? How does that play out? Well, militants obviously is a much more a, a neutral word. It, it doesn't have that, that whole connotation of, well, well, this is clearly evil and then there's a good side. Yes, well, clearly, I wouldn't use the word militant at all when it comes to a war. I would say someone might be, I don't know, a militant uh, campaigner for animal rights or something like that. I would say it's very clear that what happened on October 7th was a terror attack. It was targeting civilians in the most heinous way possible. But I would also say in the context of actual fighting, I think it's OK to call Hamas fighters if they're involved in fighting, we can call them fighters or militia, but if they're involved in terrorism, they're terrorists. So I wouldn't use the word militant at all. But I actually wouldn't get too hung up on just this one word. I'm more concerned with the um, double standards, with the obsession in covering Israel to the detriment of every other conflict in the world. People often point out to say Ukraine, but actually there are dozens of conflicts going on in the world. There are dozens of border disputes. There are hundreds or thousands of human rights issues and infringements all over the world. Um, we know that uh, our, our civilians also died, for example, in Yemen, when American British warplanes targeted the Houthis, but no one is jumping up and down and shouting genocide or that American Britain are deliberately trying to kill civilians because American Britain are not deliberately trying to kill civilians and nor is Israel. And of course, when it comes to, um, you know, rights for people in the Arab world or Muslims, as has been pointed out, there are horrendous human rights occurrences. For example, China is carrying out a real uh, form of genocidal policy on the Uyghur Muslims who are Chinese citizens. Um, in Burma, uh, Buddhist Burma is carrying out ethnic cleansing and massacres of the Rohingya Muslims, about one million of them. In Sudan, which is the world's worst war, much worse than Gaza in terms of both deaths and in terms of um, displaced people or ethnic cleansing, we have a kind of pro-Arab militia targeting black people. So the Western media may say black lives matter, but they only want to do it when it suits their own political agenda with domestic politics in the United States. They, if they really cared about black lives, they would be covering the tragedy of what's happening in Sudan. Also, I don't like the idea that you are either pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian. 
Um, in fact, if someone is pro-Palestinian, they should not want Hamas to rule Gaza. They should want Hamas to surrender, and then war wouldn't be necessary if Hamas abdicated power any more than if someone says they're being pro-Iranian by being pro the regime in Iran. There is a complete difference between supporting the people of Iran, including many brave women who have protested in the last year or so, and many have been shot or beaten up or imprisoned for wanting not to wear a hijab um, in Iran. There is a difference between um, being pro-Iranian and pro-Iranian regime. So there's a difference between being pro-Palestinian or sympathetic to the Palestinians and wanting to keep Hamas in power. And this is not explained and not emphasized at all in the mainstream Western media. But so you have this whole phenomenon, Tom, where, where, the, West, where the Western media is, is, is really repeating and, 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 and promulgating this whole rhetoric of, of really Israel hatred, um, playing up the victimhood of the of, of the Palestinians, playing up, almost inventing and, and sometimes truly inventing stories of the evil acts of Israel. And how do they think that this is going to really change the world? If Do they think that this is going to bring about peace? Is it going to, is it even bringing peace any closer? Or, or is it really driving that wedge even further and deeper and deeper as that Western media tells these lies and libels about Israel, it, it it doesn't provide any space for for discussion. You can't really have a discussion with a country that's carrying out a genocide. You can't really have a discussion with a country that, that's starving babies to death, as it were. And and so how what do these journalists believe is 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 the change that they're making? Are they are they looking for peace or are they just obsessed with Israel and 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 I would say even promoting the destruction of Israel? Well, <clears throat> first of all, let me just say, there are, of course, quite a lot of journalists and some news outlets who have put uh, the Israeli uh, viewpoints or Israeli spokespeople's um, uh, narratives. Uh, for example, in Britain, the Daily Telegraph, up to a point, the Daily Mail, the Sun, which is a tabloid, in the United States, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, and so on. So I don't want to say it's all the media, but the media which is slurring and slandering Israel, such as The Guardian in Britain or The New York Times and Washington Post in the United States, they have, how can I say, more influence among people like school teachers and academics and policy makers. So even though the Guardian's circulation is lower than that of the Daily Telegraph or Daily Mail, the Guardian is the newspaper which academics and other people of influence, um, you know, who help form opinions, they read the Guardian more than they read the Daily Telegraph. Likewise in America with the New York Times. Now, clearly, the population is not necessarily swayed by the narrative of some of these news outlets. I'll give you an example of, away from the conflict. In America, if, um, if one was swayed by the voices of the mainstream traditional media, Donald Trump would not be on about 2% support. But in fact, opinion polls show he's on about 50%, perhaps even more support. I personally don't support him. But clearly, people are not listening to everything they hear about Donald Trump um, in the New York Times or CNN or so on. If they did, um, he wouldn't be having so much support. And likewise with Israel, um, the media, in addition to slandering Israel and also slandering supporters of Israel in the West, which means Jews effectively, um, they also damaging themselves and showing themselves to be totally biased and one-sided. And we see it also with academics. You know, maybe, for example, those uh, heads of the American universities, Harvard, Penn, and uh, MIT, I think it was, who embarrassed themselves in a congressional uh, committee by refusing to say whether calling the, for the genocide of Jews on campus was something that should be criticized, and they were saying it was context dependent. They may be proud of themselves and they may be getting pat patted on the back by their fellow academics at Harvard and elsewhere, but in fact, all they're really doing is bringing Harvard 
and other, other institutions into disrepute. The general public looks on in bewilderment. So I would like to think that up to a point, the BBC and, and, and the New York Times are also embarrassing themselves. That's not to say that they shouldn't criticize Israel where criticism is warranted. They absolutely should criticize Israel. Israel is not perfect. But the sheer exaggerations or concoctions or bias, the sheer obsession with covering Israel as if there's nothing else in the world, as if it's the only thing anybody wants to read about, is not only ridiculous, but one should also ask, is it what their viewers and readers want? So, for example, my neighbor um, subscribes to the International New York Times, and they, uh, they give me it every week for me to look through afterwards, the print edition. And it is obsessed by Israel, and this is the International Edition. And I'm thinking, why on earth does the New York Times think that its readers in Singapore or Hong Kong or Rio de Janeiro or Sydney, Australia, want to read about Israel and Gaza day after day after day. Um, have they done any internal readership um, um, opinion about what their readers actually want to read about? They simply cannot be only interested in one conflict. Um, there is no way that people in uh, Japan or Brazil are so obsessed by Gaza. Um, even if what was being reported about Gaza was true, which it's not. So to allude to something you said a little bit earlier, Morris, there probably is an undercurrent of maybe anti-Semitism or maybe even subconscious anti-Semitism that means they want to kick Israel in particular more than they even kick other Western democracies. So when Britain and America were bombing ISIS in uh, Raqqa in Syria or Mosul in Iraq uh, three or four years ago. And just to remind people, Mosul, the second biggest city in Iraq that was occupied by ISIS, the, is the Islamic State, Mosul had a population of 3.7 million. In other words, almost twice the population of Gaza. And of course, lots of civilians died, not because Britain and America were trying to, because ISIS, a terror group like Hamas, embedded themselves and forced civilians not to leave. So unfortunately, some civilians died, but the media didn't pour over this and accuse Britain and America of genocide and every crime under the sun. And also, I don't think anyone can really seriously suggest, including the populations of Raqqa and Mosul, that it's not better off now that ISIS are no longer in control. So I don't know who really thinks that Palestinians in Gaza, other than Hamas's own supporters, want to live under Hamas, an Iranian terror group that is totally corrupt, that keeps uh, food and supplies for itself, and uh, shoots and imprisons and tortures and beats anyone who challenges their rule. I mean, exactly on that on that note, Tom. Really, no one would have believed figures that and and reprinted and and, and definitely not presented them as as unquestionable fact. Uh, figures of uh, and statistics of of civilians killed in Mosul, but that were that were published by ISIS, and yet in Gaza there is that almost affinity, this this desire to to connect with the terrorists and to be their their their, their mouthpiece, without any type of really not I wouldn't say even a professional standard, but even a basic standard of investigation. How did you corroborate the figures? What did you investigate? Who did you hear from? What was the source of the information? How does that all go out the window when you're talking about Hamas? Well, it's very dishonest journalism. Look, it's not just ISIS. If, I don't know, Vladimir Putin suddenly announced that Ukrainians had bombed Moscow and killed 5,000 civilians, even if they reported it in the West, which they probably wouldn't, they would bring along commentary to say, we don't think this is true, or Putin has a track record of not telling the truth, or this doesn't sound likely. So when Israel's accused of something by Hamas, and there's some notable examples where the media was forced to walk back, like the um, Islamic Jihad rocket that hit the car park of Al Ahli Hospital in Gaza in uh, November, I think it was. On the 17th of October. 
17th of October, and within minutes, Hamas announced 500 people had died. So first of all, if that was really the case, how on earth could they have counted 500 people? I mean, Israel, to show the honesty of Israel, was estimating about 1,400 people were killed on October 7th. And then later, Israel reassessed that, uh, or rather reduced that figure, and said it was about 1,200. And that is because Israel was painstakingly going through um, trying to identify bodies, many of whom had been chopped up by Hamas or burnt beyond recognition by Hamas. So Israel reduced its figures. Hamas, on the other hand, not only do they have a track record of lying, but who on earth in the BBC studios thinks that anyone could have counted that number of dead if it had hit a hospital? Plus, the very next day, the award-winning chief Middle East correspondent of the BBC, Jeremy Bowen, um, showed footage of the hospital that was still standing. It was clear that this uh, missile had hit the car park, not the hospital. And it was also clear almost immediately that it was hit by an Islamic Jihad rocket. The problem for the media to publicize this will be to admit, first of all, that Islamic Jihad and Hamas fire thousands of rockets. They'd also have to admit that um, based on past estimates from past conflicts, about 25% of all Hamas and Islamic Jihad rockets fell short landed inside Gaza and killed and injured Gazans. And that's likely to probably be the case in the current conflict, but they don't want to draw attention to that. It muddies the water. They want a simple, clear narrative with a bad guy, a good guy. They don't want to ask hard questions such as, why do we want Hamas to be in control? Is Hamas just a proxy for Iran? Do we really want Iran to have a victory? Do we indeed want Islamic terrorism worldwide to have a victory? Because if Hamas declares victory at the end of this conflict, if they're still in control of Gaza, this will be viewed as a great victory for radical Islam everywhere, including in Europe. So we have militants among the Muslim communities of the United Kingdom and France and Belgium, Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands and elsewhere, and people inside Britain who have, who have previously thought, well, we would love to have Sharia law in Britain, but it's not actually possible. They will think, you know what? If Hamas can beat the mighty IDF, the mighty Israeli army, well, do you know what? It might be possible that one day Britain too can live under Sharia law. That doesn't mean there'll be a violent intifada in Britain, but they'll use a form of tactics slowly, slowly to, you know, introduce, I don't know, compulsory halal food in all British schools or make Ramadan a national holiday and so on and so on. And intimidate, as we already see with members of parliament in Britain, standing down following death threats um, by Islamic Jihad organizations in Britain. So there doesn't seem to be an awareness that a victory for Hamas doesn't just have repercussions for Israel. Now, there may be journalists in the West that hate and despise their societies so much in a kind of post-Marxist way that they're okay with destroying the West from within. But I suspect most journalists are not desiring that, but they're just not thinking very far down the line. They're just taking whatever the local Palestinian stringers are taking photos of or reporting from the battlefield in Gaza. And they feel sorry for the Palestinians, as do I, as does anyone feel sorry for Palestinian civilians, as I do for Israeli civilians and civilians in any conflict in the world. Um, but instead of saying, why this is happening, how can this be stopped? Should we be examining what happens in other conflicts, like in Ukraine, when Russia invaded Ukraine? Within days, I think six or seven million Ukrainians Ukrainians took sought refuge in neighboring countries such as Poland and Hungary and elsewhere, and they got out of harm's way, even though actually Ukrainians could have gone from eastern Ukraine to western and central Ukraine to avoid uh, Russian troop movements. Or, for example, in the Syrian conflict, we have millions of Syrian civilians seek refuge over the border in Turkey and in uh, Jordan and in Lebanon. So why on earth? are Western commentators and journalists not saying that Palestinian civilians from Gaza 
could have taken refuge over the border in Egypt to allow Israel and Hamas to fight it out. We know that plenty of money to immediately build a um, perfectly nice uh, refugee centers in uh, in uh, across the border so, in Sinai. We see how much money the government government of Qatar spent on the football, the soccer World Cup in the end of 2022. So only a year and four months ago, they spent billions on the World Cup infrastructure. I think uh, Saudi Arabia spent billions on building millions of, of very nice tents with air conditioning by Mecca for uh, pilgrims, not even used. So why on earth in this conflict are people not wanting Palestinian civilians to be allowed to get out of the way? And I would say that on a subconscious le level, just like Hamas is almost enjoying civilians dying because it suits their narrative, it suits their weaponization against Israel. Anti-Semites or people that want to give Israel a bloody nose, they almost want Palestinians to be starving or dying because then they can turn around and say, look at that horrible Jewish state. We've heard all the time that the Jews suffered in history and they suffered in the Holocaust and pogroms. Let's try and pretend that Israel is behaving in such a terrible, almost genocidal way that we will never again have to feel guilty that we collectively in Europe aided and, aided and abetted uh, the Nazis in a worst genocide of ever, I would say, the Holocaust. So it's maybe subconscious. I'm not suggesting that a journalist literally says, hey, I want there to be a genocide of Palestinians. But I think they need to ask themselves hard questions and look in the mirror to think what's really going on. The and, to, the yeah. to, sorry, go on. No, I just want to add one thing going way back in time. When I first uh, was a reporter, on the Middle East, which was um, a little bit before the Second Intifada broke out in the year 2000. And then there was the Janine Massacre, the so-called Janine Massacre, where Saib, Saib Erekat, who was then the kind of spokesperson for the Palestinian Authority, he said 500, Pal in fact, he said 1,000 Palestinians had died and then 500. And um, Israel correctly said that actually 52 had died, of which 27 were suicide bombers and armed combatants. And my uncle in London, who was a, actually the, was a fashion optician, he used to design glasses, very not political. And he just said, well, you know, Tom, the left love a good massacre. And he's right. You know, they actually like exaggerating the figures. I, I remember when I first um, was interested in the Middle East, way back in 1982, in the Lebanon, the first Lebanon war, when there was the massacre in Sabra and Shatila by the Christ Christian militia of PLO fighters. And I think initially they said about 150 people died in Sabra and Shatila. And over the years, this 150 became 500, and then 1,000, and then 2,000. They're just making up figures. And I can only suggest they're making up figures because they want to pin that massacre, even though it was carried out by Lebanese Christians, they want to pin it on Israel, on Ariel Sharon, just like they want to pin all the deaths in Gaza on Israel, even though some of them are caused directly by Hamas rocket fire. Others of them are just natural deaths, people dying of old age in the last six months in Gaza. They've all been added on to the figures and then lumped onto the dead in Gaza. And then there's just a claim, Israel killed them. And it's almost like they're enjoying um, trying to portray Israel as some kind of murderous, meekly murderous country when it's nothing of the sort is true. And that, that, that's unbelievable, Tom. You, uh, you say that the West, the, the, the left does like a good massacre unless, and there is a caveat there, unless it's the Jews who are being massacred, Absolutely. then there's no exaggeration of the numbers. There's no, uh, uh, um, there's no great claims of, well, look at this massacre that's being carried out when it's a Palestinian terrorist murdering, massacring Jews. Suddenly the, the left isn't so interested in them in, in the massacre. And it's in the same way, not interested in any way, this criticism of the Arab world in general. That seems to be something that once someone initially made that claim of Islamophobia, it's now, whilst you correctly said, and, and, and really without reservation, I would say that it is the right way to go. 
Israel is not perfect. Israel, when it does things wrong, needs to be criticized. And that is perfectly legitimate. But no one is talking about the fact that all of the Arab countries have closed their doors to the Palestinians. There is not one Palestinian refugee from this current war. Israel, on the other hand, I don't know for, for, for our, our, our viewers, I don't know if you, if you uh, knew this, that, uh, about a year and a half ago, the Ukrainian foreign ministry via its embassy here in Israel submitted a petition to Israel's Supreme Court against the decision to limit the number of refugees that Israel would take in from, from the Ukraine. Now you have a foreign government petitioning Israel's Supreme Court against the decision of Israel's Minister of uh, uh, Interior, and they actually won. Right? That, 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 that's a situation oh. that we're talking about, where Israel receives uh, all of these refugees. And yet, no one's talking about the fact that Egypt, the world, the Arab countries, would even Europe, would prefer to see dead Palestinians rather than possibly entertain this idea of giving them refuge. Uh, How do you even explain yeah. that? That's not even hatred of, 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 of Israel. It's not even bias against Israel. It's, it's, it's almost outright hatred against the Palestinians themselves. Well, I'll just go further on one of the points you just made. About last week, there was a court hearing in Israel uh, um, for Palestinian gays, homosexuals, to make sure they could still be giving refuge in Israel. And during the course of this war, um, a number of Palestinian gays, mainly from the West Bank, have been given asylum in Israel. Meanwhile, in the most bizarre uh, act of all, we have on American universities actual organizations called Queers for Palestine that shouting from the river to the sea, essentially uh, calling for the destruction of Israel, while Israel is actually giving refuge to Palestinian gay people. Also, uh, the niece of the main Hamas leader in Qatar, Ismail Haniya, was in an Israeli hospital being treated at Israeli taxpayer expense. His Last sister and is, a, is an Israeli citizen. Yes, well, so is his niece and others. So th this would really spoil the narrative about apartheid Israel when uh, to point out that, in fact, lots of Israeli Arabs and Druze have actually been volunteering to uh, fight for Israel. And certainly many helped Israeli Jews on October 7th, rescuing and bringing some Israeli Jew Jews to to safety. Some Israeli Bedouin remain among the hostages that are being held by Hamas. All of this muddies the water of the idea there's some kind of fictional apartheid, which the government of South Africa and others want to pretend is happening in Israel. And we see that word apartheid, like that word genocide and starvation, repeated in supposedly respectable media, like the New York Times and Guardian. It is disgraceful. It also so might I add, um, is a terrible disservice to the actual victims of South African apartheid, of actual genocides. How is a young South African going to learn about what apartheid really was in South Africa, which was a clear legalistic uh, system under South African law at the time, if they misuse the term now? How are we going to understand what a real genocide was if we just throw these terms around and it, they become meaningless terms, genocide? They are real genocides. For example, there is a partial genocide genocide going on in Congo right now that no one cares about. So in answer to your other point, yes, in a way, people don't care about Israelis, but they don't care about Palestinians either. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is like a political football, like a kind of gladiatorial, Roman-style gladiatorial um, bout where the world looks on and enjoys watching Israelis and Palestinians fire rockets, rockets at each other or bash each other. And lots of other people use this conflict for their own motives. So, you know, take Turkey, Erdogan will use this conflict, Iran. It, di it diverts from the serious economic and human rights problems within Iran. Even in Britain, where I'm from, the British Labour Party, that's obsessed by Gaza, instead of dealing with actual problems that Britain has, some, many Labour Party activists want to obsess over Gaza. It's a, di it's a diversionary tactic. 
And the, 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 the use of the Palestinians as pawns against Israel seems to be something which is really truly ingrained in that Western media, in that Western, uh, uh, I hesitate to call it a liberal approach because there's nothing really liberal about it. It's just using human beings as pawns in order to, to, to attack Israel, the state of Israel, Jews in general. And then you see all of this media really bubbling over onto the streets of London, onto the streets of, of, of capitals around the world. I was interviewed on, on, on a television program uh, really just a few weeks ago. Really, it, 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 it was already um, the beginning of February. The uh, idea, the story of the Al Ahli Hospital had already come up. It was October 17th. We know that it was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad missile. We know that it wasn't 500 people. We know that it was no more than 20 to 50 people. And it wasn't even Israel's fault. And yet, as part of the questions that I uh, uh, um, was asked on that program, and this really is the power of the media. Once you've sent one of these libels out into that cyberspace uh, reality, it's almost impossible to bring it back. And that libel keeps coming up and up. And so I was asked, well, how do you explain why Israel bombed the El Ahli hospital? And, 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 I, I, and I was truly stunned. How in the situation of today, where we know that is clearly not true, that that wasn't a truth, it never was true. How can you still three months later be holding on to that falsehood as part of your savvy, as part of your consciousness, as part of your approach to uh, the Middle East and the conflict itself. And I, 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 I shudder to think how many other of these libels, of these really outright lies, are there and are sitting on people's consciousness, sitting on their minds, thinking, well, this is what the Jews are doing, and is really forming part of their ideology against Israel, understanding really the power of the media. Well, yes, and that's why we have a worldwide massive increase of anti-Semitism in countries around the world. It's definitely fueled by this, and it's very irresponsible of the media. Part of it's just laziness. They just copy each other. And there's a kind of circle, so it's not just the media, but supposedly reliable um, institutions, I mean, international bodies, the United Nations, World Health Organization, supposedly respectable human rights uh, organizations, like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, they all copy each other. So, you know, if, if the World Health Organization says there's a brink of mass starvation and then the BBC reports it, then journalists will almost be frightened, you know, to believe you or believe anybody contradicting it because it's like a, a circle. And in, in, in effect, they are discrediting all these international organizations, which for all their faults, we need them. We need to know that the World Health Organization or UNICEF or, you know, the UN Secretary General is basically reliable. We need to know they're reliable. Or we know, need to know that the head of Harvard and, and most uh, prestigious universities in the world are reliable and believe in the truth. And if they're just going to all copy each other in one big swirl of misinformation and groupthink, it's not only Jews in Israel that are going to suffer, it's information itself. No wonder so many people in America and indeed in European countries are turning to alternative media and will, will have more respect for someone like Donald Trump, or we see other populist leaders like Geert Wilders who won more votes than anyone else in the Netherlands. We see extremist parties in Germany and France, Italy and elsewhere rising because there's a general lack of trust in the entire media. The, the, the lies they tell about Israel and Jews is just maybe one of the most stark and worst examples. They are destroying themselves, the media. We will get to a point that people younger than myself or yourself will just not follow the media at all. They'll just be in internal social media groups on TikTok with their friends, just believing their own social bubbles, and no one will trust you know, some the head of the UN or the head of Harvard or the BBC correspondent on anything, and uh, it's a it's it's damaging beyond just is you know it's not only Israel and Jews and ordinary Palestinians that suffer from this. It's all of us. Really, on on, on that front, Tom, I have to say that 
I think the damage has already, I, I would hope that the damage has already been done. How is it any more possible to believe the UN Secretary General when he talks about those same blood libels that we know aren't true? How can we believe UNICEF that focuses only on Palestinians and ignores um, dead uh, 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 Jewish children? How can we believe Philip Lazzarini, the head of UNRWA, who says he didn't know about the Hamas tunnels underneath UNRWA's headquarters when they were, when, and Israel showed this, there were electricity lines going from the headquarters down through the floors into the tunnels when the car park of the headquarters was caving in a, a, a few years ago. Everybody knew that it was because Hamas was digging tunnels underneath UNRWA headquarters. And yet all of these players have managed to almost maintain their credibility, maintain their, 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 their status, and are still quoted when you when you look at uh, uh, even the, the recent decision of the International Court of Justice that quotes UNRWA <coughs> as a reliable source of information when we know that UNRWA, UNRWA is, enti is entirely connected to um, uh, Hamas and, and almost controlled by Hamas at every level. Um, Hamas has completely yeah. infiltrated and taken over UNRWA. And yet that is the source of official information quoted and brought forward in a ruling of the highest court in the, on earth, as it were. Um, and, well, and they don't it, seem it, to be yeah. losing their status. Well, it, it, it's worse than that. I mean, the examples you're given are for people that follow this conflict quite closely, but they're broader um, gaps in people's knowledge, such as at least half of the population of Israel, the Jewish population of Israel, descend from Jews who were expelled or ethnically cleansed from Middle Eastern countries. And, you know, people have no clue. And also, it is, it, we, we titled this talk, Help or Hindrance to Solving the Conflict. It is undoubtedly a hindrance because I think most people want, you know, Israelis and Palestinians to live in peace. You know, I certainly do. And simply trying to promote the lives of a terror group makes that harder. And in fact, it prolongs the conflict and means there will be hunger in Gaza and there will be more suffering in Gaza, which people of goodwill absolutely do not want. Instead of pressuring you know, the people that can pressure Hamas, like the governments of Iran and Qatar and Turkey, um, this constant pressure for Israel to basically um, stop before well, and leave Hamas in power, which is what the pressure is really trying to do, it will not bring a better situation for the people of Gaza. And that, that, that's exactly the point. I, I, I think that no one, or, or maybe they just don't care when, when, when the media promulgates these same lies and libels and they feed into this anti-Semitism around the world and feed into the demonization of Israel, then they're not bringing peace any, any closer, um, telling a biased story rather than presenting even just the facts. Hamas is a terrorist organization. It carried out a massacre. It's using and abusing the civilian population in Gaza, hiding underneath schools and mosques and hospitals, and is really breaching every part of international law. Those are almost givens, and 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 it really is unbelievably shameful that the that the Western, uh, really not all, as you said, not all of the media, but really that that liberal left wing, most influential media, has adopted a narrative which is completely warped, and that's something which I which I fear um, isn't going to change even in the near future, but. Uh, um, on that subject, Tom, I, I, I fear that our, our, our time is running out. What I, uh, um, what I try to do on these programs, as, as they sometimes seem a little bit glim and, uh, 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 and dark, leave us with a positive thought going forward. Where do you think we could make that change in the international media that would cha almost change that picture, change the way that reporting is, is, is done about Israel? Well, I'm not sure it's easy to change these big media like the New York Times and BBC, but I'll leave you on a more optimistic note. Uh, first of all, the Iranian media. I've been interviewed a number of times by Iranian opposition media, and this is 
enormous, like Mano TV, which is based in London, have 14 million followers just on Instagram in Farsi, including mainly in Iran on VPNs. They are so understanding of Israel, I cannot tell you, okay? Also, I've been interviewed on Radio Fada, which means tomorrow in Farsi and Persian. They have about five or six million people daily. They are, give Israel a far more fair hearing than the BBC or New York Times. And then in the Arab world, not among, not among sort of people of, let's say, Pakistan descent in Britain, but actual Arabs I meet in conferences and elsewhere from across the Middle East. Um, there is quite a lot of understanding of Israel. They do not want Hamas to win. I'm talking about people I've spoken to a few days ago at a conference, and those people are from countries like Bahrain, uh, Egypt, UAE, Iraq, even Lebanon, okay? They might not like Israel, but they understand that uh, the real enemies of peace are the Iranian proxy militias, including Hamas. So it's really just a lot of stupid loudmouths in the West who are now screaming about, you know, Palestine must be free because they're bored of screaming about, I don't know, um, COVID or climate change or something else. And they'll probably move back to screaming about Donald Trump if Donald Trump's re-elected. So the long-term trend in the Middle East among Arabs and Iranians is actually to accept Israel into the Middle East, and they understand perfectly well that this is a war of defense by Israel. I think that's a, really the message going forward. And, and, and one of these end goals that, are, that, that we, at least at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, have also said that we need to be able to achieve them at the end of the war. It isn't only destroying Hamas and its terror capabilities and infrastructure. It isn't only changing the way that, that, that the Palestinian society views Israel and really accepting Israel's right to exist, but at the same time, broadening the scope of the Abraham Accords. Um, if the terror war, if this uh, massacre started, even partially because of the Iranian push to intervene and undermine the discussions that were going on just in August and September about Saudi Arabia coming into the fold of the Abraham Accords and recognizing and normalizing its relationships with Israel. Um, that's really something that needs to be part of that end goal, that we see that light at the end of the tunnel. It's not just getting rid of the terrorists, but it's also expanding peace and expanding the goodwill of the, of the, of the entire area to include all of those countries who see their interests as common interests against um, uh, uh, Iran. Um, Tom, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you very much for joining us. And, uh, uh, and to our audience as well, thank you very much for joining us again. Um, we will be back with you again um, on Thursday this week. And, and until then, um, keep safe, everyone. Um, look after yourselves. And we will uh, um, see you again then. Thank you very much. And goodbye to everyone.